Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Logan Albright and I'll be your host. And today we're talking about James Fenimore Cooper's The Pilot, which is the book I read this week. I got here the Library of America. It's the old style edition Library of America with the white slip cover, very nice. I like these so much better than the new ones with the black dust jackets, don't you? I think they're great. And this is a compilation of James Fenimore Cooper's works called Sea Tales. Uh, it's got two novels in here, The Pilot and The Red Rover. I've only read the first one, The Pilot, so we're going to talk about that one. I didn't know anything about this when I bought it. I just knew that it was American, because Library of America, obviously, and that it was about the sea. And I like stories about the sea, and so I thought I would enjoy it. So I picked it up sight unseen, just thought, give it a shot and see what it's like. Uh, it is kind of early American literature. This was published in 1824. And it is a story of the American Revolution told, centered around the quasi-fictionalized character of the Scottish war hero who was on the American side during the Revolution named John Paul Jones. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wasn't he in Led Zeppelin? Uh, that's a different guy who actually took his stage name after the Scottish hero John Paul Jones. And he is the titular pilot, John Paul Jones. Being written in the early... 19th century. The writing is a little bit stilted, a little bit stiff by today's standards. I had a hard time getting into it initially, but uh, he is certainly a an accomplished uh, seafaring gent. Uh, one of the motivations for him writing this book, apparently, from what I read, is that he was tired of reading kind of sea romances by people who didn't know what they were talking about, by people who had never served on a ship, uh, and he wanted to write something that would be authentic and that would be, you know, accurate to what seafaring was actually like. And he certainly does that here uh, to a fault, I would say. <laughs> you can kind of get bogged down in the nautical details uh, of this book because he really goes so far in trying to explain the accurate details of what it's like to pilot a ship during wartime at sea. The action takes place off the northern coast of Britain in the North Sea during the American Revolution, and there's a couple of ships out there carrying Americans who are trying to do some kind of vague, it's sort of unclear what they're really trying to do. They're doing some vague war activities um, over on in Britain to help out the revolution, trying to take some prisoners and trying to cause some mischief. But it's really like, I, the thing I found most interesting about this book was how different war apparently was back then. If this is an accurate portrayal of what war was like, War was very different in the American Revolution, and it's no wonder the British lost. I always think it's astonishing that the Americans, with their rabble force, were able to defeat the greatest navy and the greatest army in the world with the British. And if this is how they conducted war, I'm not really surprised, because people are so casual about it. They don't act like it's a matter of life and death. They don't uh, treat each other brutally. They treat each other very civilized. Like, there's a part where... Um, the Americans keep getting captured by the British. Uh, they're, they're going to this abbey on the coast where very conveniently three of their like love interests or fiancés happen to be in the same place at the same time, uh, or the officers on the ship. And they all go to try to get their fiancés and to try to take some prisoners. And they get taken prisoner themselves by some of the British officers. And it's just like they don't lock them up in chains. They don't kill them. They don't torture them. They don't do anything. They just kind of like sit them in a room and say, okay, you're our prisoner. Let's have dinner now together and have a nice civilized conversation and then eventually they kind of wander off and are allowed to escape pretty easily because nobody's watching them and no one's paying attention and it's like that happens so many times like the, the sides keep exchanging prisoners and the same people be keep getting caught over and over again and they just like treat them like friends they're like oh yeah you're my prisoner now no big deal and then they escape and they're like oh you escaped again like I just can't imagine people conducting a war in that way. If you capture enemy officers, you're going to kill them, right? Isn't that the first thing you're going to do? You're not going to let them just let them go to go create mischief. There's a couple times when they explicitly say, yeah, we're going to let you go. We we're taking you prisoner for now, but in a minute we're going to let you go and have be free. Like, why would you do that? And if that's how the British were prosecuting the war, then it's no wonder they lost. It seems very silly to me. But, you know, perhaps more civilized than the war that we do now. Maybe it's it was a better time back then when people weren't so brutal when they were fighting. I don't know. But interesting. Um, the plot is fairly rudimentary, I would say. Um, like, there's no, it's not a very sophisticated book. Like, he was so interested in getting the, uh, the details of sea travel and of, of warfare down uh, accurately that he wasn't that good at actually writing a compelling story. Like, the story doesn't really go anywhere. Not that much really happens. It's unclear whether they really accomplish much 
of use to the revolution. They keep praising John Paul Jones and saying how great he is and how useful he is to the revolution. But like, it's hard to see that they really did anything meaningful in this in the episodes described in this book. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting about this is that it was influential on Herman Melville, who is one of my favorite writers, and I've done a lot of reviews of him on the channel, um, at talking about kind of his very authentic nautical uh, way of describing things. Like he was an experienced seafaring guy, and he um, was also very accurate. And he apparently read this book and really liked it, and liked how accurate it was, and it was influential on his work. But I think Melville's stories are so much more interesting, and his characters are so much more compelling than in this book. Um, it also reminded me a little bit of the Horatio Hornblower series, um, the Horatio Hornblower series by E.M. Forster, which are, you know, military maritime adventures. Uh, but those stories are, you know, written later and they are written in a much more uh, adventurous fashion. Like they're, they're a lot more fun. There's a lot more fun going on in those stories than this. This is very dry and it's written in that kind of late 18th, early 19th century style. So I wasn't the hugest fan of the pilot in the world. It was an interesting read, but it was a bit of a drag at the same time. And I didn't really get into the characters and I didn't think the action was very relatable or believable. Um, but it was interesting as a historical curiosity and as someone who's interested in stories about the sea, I think it's kind of that bridge between the, the more like Daniel Defoe style romances that are not nearly as accurate and then the more accurate writing of Herman Melville. So you see, see that and then it's sort of building up to the, the type of adventure writing you see in Horatio Hornblower. So interesting in that regard. I don't know that I'm going to get to the Red Rover anytime soon. I mean, I'm, of course, I have the book now. I want to finish it at some point. But I've got so many other books to read that I have to do those as well. So I may not get to it anytime soon. But let me know if you think, uh, if you've read these books and you have any thoughts on them and you think the Red Rover is better, maybe I should read that one in, uh, next and see if I like it better than the pilot because the pilot was a little bit dull for my liking. So there you have it, my thoughts on James Finnemore Cooper, going into it completely blind, knowing nothing about it except for that it was a part, uh, a tale of the sea. I was interested in that. And it didn't quite live up to my expectations, but what are you going to do? You can't win them all. But before I go, before I go, don't forget, it's July now, and it's time to pre-order my new book, Conform or Be Cast Out, The Literal Demonization of Nonconformists, available from Moon Books on December 1st at bookstores everywhere. You can go on Amazon now and pre-order it, and it would be so awesome because when you pre-order things, it moves me up the sales rank, and it makes it easier for other people to find it, and it makes uh, me sell more copies, and it makes my publisher happy, and it makes me happy. So if you are a fan of kind of misfits and outcasts and people who don't fit in and you're annoyed by the way that they've been persecuted over the years, boy howdy is this the book for you. You should go check it out. You have a great time with it. I've also got my other book from uh, 2019 up there, which is called um, Our Servants, Our Masters, How Control Masquerades as Assistance. If you want something a little bit more political, that one's great too. But I really want to hype this one right now because, oh man, it would be so cool if I sold a lot of copies of it. It would be great, wouldn't it? So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll be back as soon as I can with another book review. I've got a couple things on the horizon that I hope you will be interested in. I know probably uh, James Finnamore Cooper is not going to set people on fire with excitement to, uh, to watch, but, you know, it was what I was reading, so I thought I'd talk to you about it because I like to share my experiences with you, the viewing public, because that's what I do here on this channel. So I hope you've had a good time. I'm your host, Logan Albright, and I'll be back next time. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you later.